Welcome to the MSDW Podcast. I'm Jason Gumpert, editor at msdynamicsworld.com. Microsoft MVP and Forceworks CEO Steve Mordu is back, and he joins me to talk about the future of Microsoft business applications. In particular, Steve's been thinking about what Microsoft's recent advances in generative AI could mean for business and how to evaluate what's hype and what has real potential to alter job roles and business processes. One technical note, we had a bit of an issue in the capture of Steve's audio, so there are a few rough spots, but it does improve. Steve offers his perspective on the future of no-code and low-code development in the context of AI. The push to give so-called citizen developers the ability to build flows, apps, and reports has already created some friction within organizations, Steve says, and AI could make those scenarios even stranger. Forceworks is the sponsor of this episode, and Steve also tells us about how the firm's unique subscription service has evolved and how clients have responded. All right, I'm here with Steve Mordu. Hey, Steve, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Jason, how are you doing? It's been a while since we talked. It has, uh, and this is a, a great time to catch up. I think between some of the things you've been writing about and certainly some of the updates from Microsoft in recent weeks with their most recent release wave, there's certainly a lot to contemplate specifically around you know the theme of AI, and we don't have to exclusively stick with that, but it's certainly sort of the thing that's been hyped, certainly the thing that everyone wants to talk about, certainly on the marketing side from Microsoft, and I think out in the partner channel too, they're sort of grabbing onto it, and, and you've even written a bit about your thoughts about where things stand right now. So certainly a, a, an area worth chatting about and uh, something I'm looking forward to, to hearing your views on. Yeah, I'm, I tell you, I can't uh, open my phone, look on anything, social media or otherwise, without just seeing AI, AI, AI. It's blown up as though it was invented a couple of months ago, when it's actually been around for quite a while. Microsoft has been working with it for quite a while. But I did get the sense, you know, obviously with the chat GPT coming out that I think exposed to the masses AI that a lot were not aware of before, a little too abstract. And I almost feel like that even caught Microsoft a little flat footed. You know, when you look at the speed at which they have jumped all over the chat GPT version of AI just in the past couple of months and still, you know, in the last weeks or so, you know, launching things at an incredible pace. It almost felt to me like they got caught a little flat-footed with how fast that took off. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. And it's made me think of, you know, this, you know, because I'm sort of working on the premise that when you ask ChatGPT to come up with a marketing email message for you or an explainer article or blog post about you know, what does AI look like for, for business intelligence? I'm just making that up. But, you know, like if you ask it a question like that, it'll spit out something that looks, boy, a heck of a lot like the 10 other sort of blog posts I've seen on that topic and, you know, product landing pages. Because that's really what I think what it's doing. It's it's putting, it, it's rephrasing and rewording something to answer your question, pulling on what it knows or what it's read, right? And Boy, I, I just think a couple cycles down the road here when you have, let's say, some blog posts and some you know articles written or you know, marketing emails that have gone out and they all have used some amount of, of AI, generative AI, you know, that third cycle or fourth cycle where it's actually finding other AI developed things you know, content and using that to inform the next round of content it's it's generating, you know, what weird sort of, you know, discrepancies will, will work its way into the language or will work its way into the communications that even, you know, we're not imagining now. Maybe purely in a like linguistic perspective, but also for factual and data, you know, side of things. Like, will those begin to skew? I think what it feels like is really missing is, is creativity because, you know, it's not a person, right? It's a, it's a machine. It's, it's predicting the next word and coming up with copies of marketing in particular text that they've seen, which looks like every other piece of marketing text you see anywhere. Not particularly exciting, not particularly interesting. I mean, it's challenging for people, right? Trying to write copy on a website for products and stuff like that. You end up using a lot of the same kind of catchphrases and, and things and it is it's all it all feels very generic. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think there is a substantial sort of low end of communication skills out there in the world. And it comes from a variety of, for a variety of reasons. I mean, for some, it's as simple as people who are not working in their first language or some people who are just not good communicators. They need to put emails out. They need to communicate with clients in sales, whatever. And they're just doing a really bad job today. I mean, I'm sure you see those, that kind of thing all the time too. If nothing else, maybe, you know, and we could talk about some of the specific applications within Microsoft business apps, but, you know, maybe it will bring that floor up <laughs> so that most emails you get become clear and, and somewhat concise, that they're 
easier to read and sort of immediately understand. I mean, that's a big tax on anybody, right? In in work, when you're dealing with information and you have to stop and like evaluate what you're seeing because it's hard to interpret, right? So maybe that will be a sort of baseline benefit of it. And and I and maybe this is a chance to sort of talk about maybe some of the specific things that Microsoft introduced across Power Platform and Dynamics 365 and whether we think whether you think there are any there's any value to them. I'm thinking some of the most obvious ones that do seem fairly useful will be like crafting an email response if you're a sales rep, which is maybe Viva Sales more than D365, but that seems pretty handy to me. I mean, I know plenty of salespeople who don't have great communication skills, even though that's really part of their wheelhouse. And maybe that can, or, you know, or on the customer service side, and that can sort of even out the quality of of what you're getting back in those conversations. Yeah, well, I definitely think customer service is going to be one that is going to be impacted pretty strongly. It's funny because in my last chat with Charles Lamana, he was talking about, you know, some of the new things they're doing for uh, call centers and, uh, you know, this big investment they've made and all this technology they're launching for call centers, which is another reason why I kind of felt they were a little flat-footed when this happened, because it's pretty clear that it won't take very long before you'll get far more efficient and correct answers from, you know, a chat GPT bot than you would from some, you know, low paid person sitting on the other end of the phone looking up answers. I think that's one of the industries that's going to be severely impacted is going to be call centers. So I think those are all going to be gone soon, and soon, probably sooner than we think. The other one that uh, surprisingly I think is going to be code. I definitely have been playing around with code and having it write some code for me, looking at how it does that. I mean, you know, code is just rules, right? It's, it's understanding what you're trying to do and then writing down text that follows a very disciplined set of rules to get to your output. And, you know, a model like Jeff GPT ultimately, I think, is going to be better at that than people. I mean, it's got all of the internet and all of the skills to draw on to write the best possible piece of code. I think that's going to put some real pressure on the, the code developers out there. Maybe not so much on solution architects, you know, being able to tell chat GPT, this is the technology that I think I need to use for this, write some code that does, you know, X, Y, Z. But the person who would have been asked to write that code, I think is, is at risk here very soon. And it's just coming stupid fast. One of the things I've been trying to keep straight in my head when it comes to the power platform, especially, is the AI that Microsoft's trying to put out there that's meant to help users versus what's meant to help developers. Because they're sort of trying to do both at the same time. And we're talking about the developer side of it. And we see that, what, like in Power Apps through and in Power Automate as well with actually trying to accelerate the development of apps, accelerate the development of flows. It's kind of, I think that's pretty much the concept that you were just talking about. But I mean, from what I've seen, in, at least in public preview, they have some of those tools already out there. And I was actually just reading, you know, they're making sort of measured efforts to like increase the accuracy of a flow that someone creates just by sort of asking through natural language into a starting point. I know that's something that you wrote about a bit. It sounded to me like you were a bit skeptical that that was going to be something that would ever be enterprise ready or certainly anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, again, Microsoft has an advantage where they can incorporate chat GPT to a user, you know, maker type experience where you can ask a question, but it's not just running out there to, you know, to the large language model and spitting back the result. It's going back through Microsoft's filters as well of, you know, is this a correct statement? Is this the right way to build this flow? So they're able to kind of massage, you know, what's come back to be more correct. I think I hit on the peer developer side, certainly the, the co-pilot stuff they're doing in GitHub has been uh, pretty impressive. Maybe not the point where you could just tell it something and it'll, it'll develop it all for you, but as a developer working in that environment, the ability to really just ask it here, knock out this piece of, you know, non-spectacular code that's necessary that so I don't have to spend my time doing it, just some functional stuff that's required. Being able to use it really to speed up what a developer is able to do, I think is going to be probably the biggest impact on developers. But again, that doesn't help the whole development community because you know the faster a developer can do something, the fewer developers are needed to do it. Someone made the point recently, if Power Apps doesn't solve the issue of still hitting a ceiling when it comes to maintainability of apps and technical debt, it helps maybe more people get to it and maybe raises it a bit. But like you said, you still can only have so many apps right now. And, you know, Center of Excellence tools can ease that as well. But those those limits still do exist where you could have 100 more apps, but a bunch of them are useless or quickly fall out of maintenance and reliability. So those problems don't go away and AI doesn't solve those in, in any fundamental way. I think the low code, no code uh, has been kind of oversold by everybody out there that's peddling it. 
uh, including Microsoft. I think they, at one stage, you almost feel like, you know, that your grandmother could go and build something. And that this is really not that realistic. As a, a partner in the space, like many of us partners, you know, we're, we're being brought into customer scenarios where there's, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff that was developed by citizens and no disrespect to citizens, but they just don't know what they're doing. And they were led to believe that this is easy, you can do it. And they're, they're just making fundamentally incorrect decisions in the process because they just don't, they don't know what they don't know. They're building things on the wrong technologies for the desired result. The fear that I have is we're now with a, some AI capabilities to assist that person. Are they going to build even more ridiculous applications than what mm-hmm. they've built up to now by, you know, pushing a button and asking, you know, asking AI again the wrong question because they don't know what they don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually worked out to be fairly good for a lot of Microsoft partners because customers, you know, they start heading down this path, they start building stuff, and it doesn't take very long for them to realize that, you know, beyond a simple checkout app, we're really, we're not more efficient, and it's because these apps aren't put together correctly. They took the wrong fork at the very first fork because they didn't even realize there was more than one fork, and now they've got something that doesn't work, doesn't scale, isn't reliable, isn't secure. So I think I, I applaud the thought of trying to enable anybody to go build an app, but to be honest, not anybody could build an app. That's not to say there's not plenty of talented, techno-savvy citizens out there that build useful stuff, but the majority, I think, of what has been built through that door has been just junk. Uh, that, like you say, sat on a shelf until somebody finally discarded it. So then, uh, then I guess in hindsight, all it was for that was a huge waste of time. Yeah, I was going to say, in, in your view then, does that make the partner sort of the hero who can come in and, and solve that? Or has that does that end up hurting the overall sort of Microsoft pitch that partners are prepared to come in there with? You know, we have all this cool, shiny new stuff from Power Platform to OpenAI Azure Services, you know, to whatever else. Has it helped or has it hurt? I, mean, I think it's done both. I mean, sometimes, you know, obviously, you know, customers that went deep on the, the citizen side believed that they were going to accomplish something different than the outcome they actually got. So if, they're, if they feel compelled to have to bring in a partner to make the stuff work, you know, then you're kind of looked at as a necessary evil that their original plan failed and you're coming in as a result of it not working, which is not the best spot for a partner to be coming in. I mean, nobody's going to look at you as a hero for coming in and fixing a bunch of stuff they screwed up and then having to pay you for it. No, they're just going to be upset that they thought they could get a result out of that that they didn't end up realizing. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it doesn't help Microsoft for those companies that went down that path and hit that wall. But you, you see Microsoft responding to that in recent years with the press for fusion teams. I mean, they've, got, they've kind of gone back and forth. And on the partner side, I can remember going to many events where Microsoft was really pushing citizens hard, that citizen can build anything, citizens can build all sorts of things. And you look at a room full of partners, they're all looking at Charles or whoever saying that up at the front of the room, say, why are you telling us this? This isn't something a partner wants to hear. Then I think Microsoft kind of got the, they over-indexed that way. And they kind of were getting the feedback from partners that weren't too happy about this. And then they, they kind of brought it back to this fusion teams concept where, you know, I think it was a realization that, you know, Mary in the bookkeeping department is, is not an app builder, but she understands the problems. Mary needs to work with a developer or somebody who understands the platform that has more skills. And that's this idea of these fusion teams. Let's take people that understand a business problem but can't build an app, will concede now that, okay, that person isn't going to successfully build an app to solve their problem, even though they understand the problem. We're going to have to pair them up with somebody who understands how to build stuff, who may not understand the problem, but they know how to build things. And between those two, maybe we can get something functional that, that solves a problem. That's that's this fusion team's concept where it's kind of moving. But it does seem like that pendulum swings kind of back. And just to, to go back to what you were saying about the way you sort of structure some of your services, is that, I know last time we talked, you had just been launching your your new model about you know, using subscriptions or, or service as a subscription, I should say. Has some of this flowed into that offering as well? Some of this thinking that you're talking about? Yeah, actually, that's what's kind of led to that offer in the first place was, you know, now we've got this concept of a fusion team that gets assigned to a customer, you know, all the skill sets that are necessary. We just need, you know, the customer to give us, you know, what their challenges are. And they don't need it to be too detailed because, you know, a lot of these people are business analysts. They know more about a customer's problem than a customer does. So we just really just need the customer to point it where it hurts 
And then we've got <laughs> we've a distribution team approach to go in and just solve that. And that was really what led to, you know, it would be so much easier for a customer to not have to deal with a team of multiple people on some kind of an hourly model. It's just going to be impossible for them to keep track of us. And one of the things that had always bothered me and my partner blood as well is uh, customers on any kind of an hourly based model can't take their eyes off the clock. And if they can't take their eyes off the clock, they're never going to get full value out of the platform. There's just so much stuff in the platform that a customer could bring to bear on their organization, but they're never going to realize any of it. There's going to be the minimum amount they can touch because they're staring at this clock. So we just had to blow the clock. I can certainly understand that from a client perspective. I can imagine it being one of those decisions where there's maybe some apprehension and, and, and struggle to make the decision to do it, but then being very happy with having committed to that approach and getting some of the differences like you were just talking about that once you've committed to it, an organization does feel good about working that way with you as a service provider. I mean, ironically, what we really need is some more partners following a similar model. Because right mm-hmm. now, you know, you're talking to some customer who's maybe talking to three different partners, two are on hourly, some sort of hourly based model. Customers familiar with that because that's what they've always used. And then you got this oddball Steve guy coming in here with something completely different they never heard of. And it's funny because we've had lots of customers say, yeah, no, we, we really can't do that. And then we clear, but they call up and say, you know, I thought about it. It seems like a better way to do it. I mean, I'd love to have them reach that conclusion in the first call. Maybe that would be helped if more partners were moving down the similar. And frankly, I'd rather be competing with other partners with a similar model and, you know, competing with customer success stories or general intelligence or, or whatever it is that, that we compete on other than I have a completely different model. All right. Anything else you wanted to cover today? I mean, if anything else, I'm just thinking about sort of what's next for some of these you know, getting back to the technology side of it, sort of what's next on that side too, I think maybe in the same spirit, sort of as people get more comfortable with what Microsoft's putting out there, they'll change what they're asking for from their partners, or maybe they'll change their expectations for what they themselves should be, you know, using their systems for like where they should be relying more on AI, where they should be relying on doing AI sort of things themselves or, you know, and where partners are going to feel like they have to talk their customers back off the, the bleeding edge, you know, from the latest thing they've seen. I think all that's still in play. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that uh, what we saw in, in my opinion, was an opening volley uh, from uh, Microsoft into the chat GPT version of the AI game. Uh, they've been in this space for a long time on AI, but it almost today suddenly feels like a bunch of legacy AI stuff, right? I mean, it's not even that old. It already feels kind of legacy because the new stuff has just made everything else look, you know, like, like toys. And they have jumped in, you know, with all their feet in this new space. They've made their opening volley with a bunch of stuff that they've launched out of this co-pilot brand across everything. But it's pretty clear they, they've got a deep commitment down that path. I don't know what this means for things like Viva Sales. When Viva Sales launched, I wasn't sure what that meant for things like the uh, Outlook app. Because there's a lot of overlap, I think, which isn't going to help with customers and what these things do and, and, and how they work. And I'm looking at Viva Sales as already legacy technology. Yeah. What's really going to move the needle? I mean, some of these features are cool product descriptions, automated product descriptions that are very tedious to do yourself if you have lots and lots of product items in your list. Sure. That could be nice. Is it going to move the needle on Business Central sales or any of these features going to move, you know, sell more power apps licenses or power platform, you know, licenses? That's, I think that's ultimately where the questions get really critical or and determining what sticks around and what falls by the wayside to me. Well, I think this round of co-pilots is basically bolting on assistance to existing applications. I think that the the real next wave will be that these existing applications are just replaced. Yeah. Exciting times. I I really appreciate hearing your input here, Steve. Anything else you wanted to add before we wrapped up? I think that was it. That's fun. Just, you know, keep my thoughts out there. I'd love to hear what other people think. Absolutely. Yeah. We'd love to hear your thoughts as well to our listeners. We'll put a link to your recent blog post that sort of touched on some of these issues, the myth of the full stack developers, I think how you titled it. And uh, yeah, and we'll put some uh, other resources as well. Steve, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. As always, Jason. Thank you. This has been another episode of the MSDW podcast. My thanks once again to Steve Mordu for joining me. To learn more about Forceworks services as a subscription model, check out their website, forceworks.com. We'll put links in the show notes. And that's it for this episode. If you want to get in touch with me, you can send me an email, jgumpert at msdynamicsworld.com. 
For all of our updates, you can follow us on LinkedIn. Until next time, this is MS Dynamics World, signing off. Thank you.